Okay, thanks very much for the uh, uh, invitation. Yeah, I'm going to say just a few, uh, some basic uh, points about um, this constraints on personalized medicine on its scope and potential. Of course, it's a fantastic thing and it's wonderful you've got a center for it. Uh, it's just, it might be, it's worth considering some uh, very high, sort of high level data which might say something about its scope. Uh, of course, personalized medicine uh, is not uh, new. This is Jean Siviali, who introduced uh, a new way of dealing uh, with uh, bladder stones. The old way uh, was cutting people open and removing the stones, rather high mortality rate. He introduced the transurethral lithotripty approach in the uh, 1830s, and he, produ he produced these data on his uh, successful, what he thought was his successful approach. Uh, and the Academy of Sciences in Paris, they organized a commission which included Poisson, the uh, statistician, uh, and F.J. Dublé to investigate uh, uh, Siviali's claims. And uh, the commission it came out with the statements that in statistical matters, attempt, when attempting to appreciate facts numerically, the first concern above all is to leave the individual out of sight by considering a man merely as a fraction of the species. One must deprive him of his individuality in order to eliminate whatever such individuality could accidentally introduce into the question. So that's your depersonalizing uh, statistician. Uh, whereas um, uh, in applied medicine, i.e. when you're dealing with patients, on the contrary, the problem is always individual. The facts which contribute to solve it present one by one. It's exclusively the personality of the patient with which we deal. And in the end, it's the single human being that you're truly personalized. Uh, with all these idiosyncras idiosyncrasies that a, a doctor must treat. For us, the masses remain merely out of the question. So that's the distinction. So that's, you know, it's a pretty old uh, <laughs> distinction. Claude Bernard uh, was a fan of personalized medicine. You know, he talks about a surgeon who performs a, an operation and that, he, you know, he says that two out of five people die. And he says that this means literally nothing scientifically. <laughs> and it gives us no certainty in performing the next operation. For we don't know whether the next case will be among the recoveries or the deaths. So that's the uh, prehistory. Now, of course, the name's changed. You know, it's been personalized medicine. Uh, uh, and that's, and these, are, these names are all fantastic. They're like evidence-based medicine. What are you going to argue for? Prejudice-based medicine? So with personalized medicine, you argue for impersonal medicine, depersonalized medicine. And then, of course, now it's precision. So you organize, we, you know, we want imprecise medicine. Um, this is Leroy Hood, who's been one of the major advocates for this movement. You know, he's come up with this rather nice, touchy-feely, predictive, personalized, preventive, participatory um, uh, medicine. Uh, in their uh, latest paper on this, uh, they relate this also to N of 1 medicine. And they present a new approach to personal care that relies on understanding the system dynamics of an individual as opposed to relying on statistical associations. We don't need these statisticians. A clarification of these terms and concepts is necessary to comprehend the vision of 21st century medicine that will harness big data. Here we are in the Big Data Institute, and you're going to deliver scientific wellness. I feel warm inside <laughs> just sort of reading these, uh, reading these, reading these quotes out. So... Um, yeah, so that's the uh, uh, so that's the that's the that's the, uh, the the scientific wellness, the vision. So, so let's go back uh, to the sort of dawn of the so the new sort of personalized precision medicine era. Even though it's not necessarily genetic, it's definitely it's definitely the case that genetics drove this pushing for, this pushing forward of this uh, movement. And as in uh, you know Hood's title. Prediction is key to this. The notion you can sort of predict, you can avoid disease developing, you can avoid it getting uh, more severe. So uh, Francis Collins in 1999 sort of launched uh, this at the same time as the sequence of the human genome was going to be announced. By talking about hypothetical case in 2010, you've got uh, John, a 23-year-old. He's got his, high, his cholesterol is a bit high. He smokes, and then to get more precise information, so already it was precision medicine uh, on, on his risks, he's agreed to have a battery of genetic tests done. Now, this was 1999. It was the days of the candidate uh, gene study. 
uh, when John Todd was a very young man doing these. And, uh, um, uh, and so it's fair enough that, uh, Col that Francis Collins just came, he made up quite a few genes. Those he didn't, he said, you know, that these are hypothetical uh, risks, but, you know, the, C the CTP was one he was saying he talked about uh, as being based on, the, on sort of real uh, data. But, you know, you're getting these things with these, these variants have sixfold risk of lung cancer, uh, you know, fourfold risk of colon cancer, um, uh, etc. And uh, John's pleased to learn that he's not going to get uh, Alzheimer's disease, according to his genetic score, uh, but, uh, but with these genes known in 2010. But he's sobered by the evidence of the increased risks of contracting coronary artery heart disease, colon cancer, and lung cancer. And, uh, it, and in 2010, there's much to offer. The field of pharmacogenomics has blossomed, and a prophylactic drug regimen based on the knowledge of John's personal genetic data can be precisely prescribed uh, to reduce his cholesterol to normal levels. And then Collins goes to talk about CTP, how this plays an important part in metabolism and uh, high-density lipoprotein cholesterol, because then, of course, they believed that you know, HDL cholesterol was considered to be protective, and this is why the CTP gene was relating to coronary heart disease. And therefore, and there they, they cite this tiny trial which uh, showed that, you know, that claimed that pravastatin uh, had a, a greater effect in people who, were, who carried a variant in CTP. This is the area where the candidate gene studies are all probably mostly false, but uh, he's getting interactions here uh, uh, um, that uh, you're going to base your uh, prescribing on. So in, in 2003, just talking about the candidate gene studies being false, uh, Helen Calhoun and Paul McKeague and I, we published this paper, in the, which made us rather unpopular with some people in the field, which suggested that the large majority of the candidate gene studies out there uh, were uh, unreliable and were false positives. The Lancet said we had to send examples, so we did send a whole stack of examples, all of them published in the Lancet, where there was already evidence <laughs> that they, there were already evidence that they were unreliable, uh, because of course that was uh, the case. And uh, Iona uh, Millwood, Richard Pito, and others have been involved in looking at uh, CETP in a situation where there actually is a large effect genetic variant. There aren't, there's no reasonably common or common in any way at all large effect genetic variant of uh, CETP in uh, European origin populations. But in the uh, Kaduri study uh, uh, in uh, East Asia, there's a, 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 a loss of function variant associated with a very large difference in CETP a large difference uh, in uh, HDL cholesterol and small beneficial effects on lipoprotein A, triglycerides, uh, and LDL cholesterol, and could, could be combined with the other variants, but the whole overall score is driven by this, and the power is driven by this East Asian um, um, specific variant. Uh, and then uh, looking at this in relation to vascular disease, there's no, uh, strong, no, ev no strong evidence of uh, any effect. One was expecting a protective effect uh, for variant related to higher uh, HDL uh, cholesterol. Uh, and, uh, and this illustrates the fact that, there's, that genetic variants, which were you know, proposed to be useful for personalized medicine for deciding whether to give someone pravastatin or not, are, may, might actually provide really good evidence about population health, about population level risks. And these sorts of data uh, are those which uh, demonstrated that you know, the drive to raise HDL cholesterol, the literally billions of dollars spent on randomized controlled trials to raise HDL cholesterol, one doubts that if you'd had these uh, genetic data and now the data using very large number of variants related to HDL cholesterol, which suggests that it is not causal using Mendelian randomization uh, as the approach. And indeed, you can work out with a CETP inhibitor which has a small beneficial effect, you can, de uh, um, you can demonstrate uh, uh, that a Mendelian randomization study published simultaneously to the, 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 the very large trial uh, predicted the effect of the trial very well. And this, the beneficial effect is all due to the uh, APOB lowering uh, aspect of the CTP inhibitor. But this is just to say that the, the, the personalization, John wouldn't have done well uh, by having his uh, CTP variant measured and uh, the treatment uh, based upon that. But then, but here we have something which is apparently working for John. He's confronted with the reality of his own genetic data. So he's, it's because of his genetic risk of lung cancer, he arrives at the crucial teachable moment. So the fact he's smoking 
And that, has a, that gives you a rather higher relative risk of lung cancer than his, than his genetic variant. That's not teachable, but it's teachable because he's got a genetic variant and he kicked the habit. Sadly, John is not representative of people in randomized controlled trials. This is a systematic review done in 2016 of, of feeding back such genetic data and seeing whether it changes people's uh, behaviors. Here's a more recent, this is a very recent trial from a great team in Cambridge, which demonstrates the same thing. So it's only John, sadly, who reaches a, a teachable moment. OK, so that's 1999. So 2010 approaches. So this is obviously a time to look back and reflect on what was proposed in, 2000, uh, in, two, in 1999. And uh, Francis Collins does indeed reflect. And this is his editorial uh, as 2010 approaches. The genome gets personal almost. Guess what? It's the year to perfect vision, 2020. <laughs> Brilliant. And Amy, it's Amy now, so Amy's changed sex. John's changed sex. And she's decided to be a whole genome sequencing, not this crap battery of 20 tests that John had. And get, she's going to, she's got mild asthma, and she's going to have a physician select an optimal therapy based on Amy's uh, genetic variants. And uh, she gets, she's got teachable moments too. There was learning though, as 2020 approached, uh, and the new initiative, the Precision Medicine Initiative, was released. It was released with, that, with a really sober and sensible, you know, very sensible statements. You know, many possibilities for future applications spring to mind. You might, genotyping might reveal particular genetic variants that confer protection. Uh, you know, then you can do all these other omics as well. You can do micro, um, uh, you know, the microbiome, and you can do uh, other measures. And, but, but such innovations will first need to be tested in pilot studies, and we'll need to evaluate the most promising approaches in much larger numbers of people over longer periods. Extraordinarily, very sensible. But, uh, but way, way behind what was already predicted for 2010. Now, you know, it's easy to say these things. It is difficult, you know, it's difficult to make predictions, particularly about the future. You can decide that was either by Niels Bohr or Mark Twain or by Sam Goldwyn uh, or by uh, Yogi Berra or by Anonymous, all of whom have been claimed to be the origins of that uh, statement. But you can predict that it's difficult to predict, and that's what I'm going to talk about. There's evidence which suggests that prediction has its limitations. And I'll give four lines of evidence. The first is from classical genetic studies, and it's the presence of what Sewell Wright in 1921 <coughs> referred to as intangible variants. So in Wright's famous paper, looking at uh, his, uh, his guinea pig coats, uh, he was doing crosses. He was, so he, could, uh, he could, was controlling uh, the genetics, and then he was looking at the piebald patterns. Uh, on the uh, uh, guinea pigs, and then quantifying the contribution of the, uh, of the, of the genetic variants uh, and then the, the environment shared by the uh, guinea pigs sired by the same dam, and then what he referred to as intangible variants, which is, which is, is what has become known in uh, genetic, in twin studies, for example, as the non-shared environment. Now, of course, for Sewell Wright, he's looking at something developmental. It's something which is actually happening during the developmental period. So the fact that it is likely to be stochastic developmental events, you know, somatic mutations, epigenetic changes, et cetera, those sorts of changes was, was, uh, you know, is, what, is what comes to mind. You know, he said differences must be due to irregularities in development due to intangible sorts of causes to which the word chance is applied. But then following on from this, many studies were done for later age phenotypes uh, in, uh, uh, in many, many animal breeding studies. And Lush's uh, classic uh, uh, book, uh, Animal Breeding Patterns, which is highly recommended uh, to anyone who likes 500-page books written in the 1940s, is a masterpiece, <laughs> has all these examples. And this is when they start talking about things b uh, being you know, shared between siblings between, or between uh, litter mates because they're looking at later life phenotypes like weight, weaning age, development, et cetera, and they show the same thing as uh, Sewell Wright does, we have this high contribution of intangible, this intangible variance. Now, the sad point, really, where things go a bit wrong is that when the behavioral geneticists get a hold of these uh, um, you know, data, they then call this non-shared environment, and people only basically think about it in terms uh, of sort of behavioral traits. But of course, you see precisely the same uh, in, in uh, disease outcomes. So this is the, very, the large uh, twin study uh, consortium from the Nordic uh, countries, which did class, just classical 
a twin study, decomposition of the variants into additive genetic variants, into shared environment. That's the things which make people brought up in the same family or you know, <laughs> guinea pigs with the same dam, et cetera, more similar. And then non-shared environment, which are factors which, which uh, are not related to the environment that's shared uh, in, the, in the household or in the pen if you're an animal. Uh, well, we're animals, but you know, we don't call them pens. Uh, and what you see is just that, is, this is what you see for all you know, traits, virtually all traits, except you know, height is one that doesn't. Virtually all traits show the highest contribution to the variance uh, is the non shared environment. Now, this includes measurement error, but for many of the traits, like, the, like this the piebald pattern, measurement error is not going to be a massive factor. So this, these, these are just sort of chance developmental events which, you know, which during development will be, uh, in, in, you know, will, will be at this, probably at the stage of genomic changes or, or epigenetic changes or the cytoplasmic changes which are then transmitted as division, et cetera, et cetera, those sorts of factors. But then during, but then during life will also just become chance events that happen uh, uh, as one gets older. But, so then you just notice that for all these cancers, you know, uh, there, is, there is heritability. Uh, for all of them. Well, uh, another sort of sad hangover from, uh, from behavioral genetics is what you do is you fit the model, and if, if you don't get a significant, if P is 0 0.051, you fit the, uh, the shared environmental effect to naught, even if the com when the confidence intervals go up to 0 0.35, which is a rather sad thing, because it gets, it's, it, this, this is one of the things that's contributed to, to this, the statements that you know, parents don't matter, there's no shared environmental effects on things, etc. It's because they haven't got enough numbers, so you just fit it to zero, uh, which is, uh, is, is extremely sad, and hopefully the demise of significance will mean that people will stop doing that. But there, you know, there's, so there's generally you know, small to, to medium, small to moderate shared environmental effects. And if you're interested in the rest of the argument defending this, because I'm going to move on from this just to assume it's true, the only paper I've written out of the however many it is that's worth reading is this one. So uh, it's the only thing I've written which is of any value to read, which has the basis of uh, the 25, 28 pages of something of defense of why this sort of way of thinking makes sense. This is one picture from it, which is of clonal marbled crayfish. So these are these are, these are this crayfish who developed a way of uh, developed reproduction through parthenogenesis, and they are now filling the, they were like pets in Germany, and they're now filling all the uh, canals and rivers in Germany because people threw them away, because they, they just, as once, as once they can divide, they can carry on dividing. So they're, they're identical, they're put in an in a, uh, in a aquarium, and, and the environment of the aquarium, they, they try to make it as constant as possible, uh, and uh, these are all exactly the same age. So imagine you're a life course epidemiologist or a precision medicine enthusiast trying to find out what it was that, these, that led to some of these being fat and some of them being uh, skinny. You're not going to actually do very well. And the same thing is true for so many, you know, but it's just these are more photogen photogenic than uh, C. elegans or yeast or whatever, but all of which show precisely the same effects. And because I know that people like cute things. This is the latest animal model that people like. These are uh, armadillos uh, have four identical, uh, have, have litters of four genetically identical uh, armadillos. And there's a, a paper about, you can look at all how the phenotypes differ, even however you try to standardize uh, environments. There's a, gr a great recent review about the problem of non-shared environment and behavioral gen genetics, which just isn't, I don't think, discussed very much by uh, epidemiologists. So one thing about the non-shared environment is that uh, it's not stable. You know, non many of the non-shared environmental effects don't, uh, don't relate, if you measure them at one stage, don't relate to the similar uh, effects uh, at a di at different age, that, which reflects their sort of central stochasticity, uh, their, their changing nature. Uh, but, but, but also good is that that is especially true for behavioral traits, <laughs> psychological states, et cetera, which is what uh, you know, the behavioral geneticists uh, generally study. Uh, what's nice about biology is it comes out with sensible answers. Uh, and if you look at uh, uh, kids with uh, uh, autism uh, and from, uh, from, twins, from twin <laughs> studies, there you see that the, the non-shared environmental components are much more stable. And that's probably because, like Sewell Wright's guinea pigs, the events you're actually looking at are things that happened during fetal development, for example, which are, will be stable every molecular switches which have long-term effects. So, but for this sort of, these sort of data, this is uh, you know, people's mood. 
in a, 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 in a randomized controlled trial, uh, the GenDEP, which uh, randomized uh, a strategy of basing your prescription for your antidepressants on genotypes. There's been a very large number of these trials. You don't, uh, I mean, I wonder how much they've been discussed in this uh, center, the results of these trials. It'd be very good for someone to do a systematic review of them all. Might not be a popular thing to do. Uh, but, the, but these are data on t uh, you know, 20 participants uh, for their depression over, the, over their mood level over a few weeks in the trial. It's a big trial. And you know, the arguments of the paper is we can understand why, some of them, why, why people have all these different trajectories. The other, th the other notion is at least it's stochastic. It's just, the, the, the large driver of, the, of, of this uh, phenotype is non-shared environment, and that that's, what's, uh, that's, what, that's what's driving it. So it's not going to be useful you know, uh, trying to actually identify stable predictors of the of response. Uh, this is when it was released. It said, you know, we're going to do lots of predictive stuff, uh, and uh, it's going to help. Uh, it's going to lead uh, help clinicians uh, to using a ge simple genetic test to assist them for choosing the right antidepressants for their patients. I don't know. Is there any GPs here or psychiatrists? Anyone who's found there's a simple genetic test to help you decide on uh, what you're going to prescribe? And this was a press release when it came out. The study has the potential to revolutionize the treatment of depression. Its main aim is to make it easier for doctors to decide which antidepressant most likely to work, et cetera. Then you go into the website, you look at the results, and what you notice is last updated 2008, before the final results of the trial came out, as you might imagine, the trial showed absolutely no benefit, uh, no, no effect of actually knowing the genotype prescribed by genotype, but they've published about 100 papers on these trajectories. <laughs> uh, now, of course, uh, you know, with, with uh, uh, data such as this, uh, in it, when you're looking at actual, at actual change, you, you need test retest to get some, any notion about whether they're stable. The, uh, you know, the, suggest, the genetic decomposition of these sorts of traits would suggest they will not be stable. And I would re uh, recommend any, uh, every, anyone interested in this to read Stephen Sen's brilliant paper on the statistical pitfall, pitfalls of personalized medicine. You know, these are really, really simple things. You know, if you take any data, you can divide up people who respond to people who show no response. But if you don't then actually do any retest on those, categorize, put them into those categories and then test them again, those data are worthless. So you have to be able to divide them up. And as uh, Stevenson has shown in many cases, you know, most, most, of the, most of the situations where that's done look like that. There's no stability uh, in the measures at all. So if you get any paper uh, claiming to actually analyze the response, don't bother reading it if it hasn't got, just throw it away if it hasn't got a, a retest. So what does this mean? Let's then think about what this means for uh, disease again. So here we've got Winnie. So Winnie's been smoking for 93 years. She's lighting a cigarette from her 100th uh, <laughs> birthday cake. She started at age eight. Now, you know, I mean, what people thought is, you know, we, let's sequence Winnie. Let's find it. Winnie must have got some great genetic resistance uh, to this condition. But, you know, the non-shared environment, 70% of lung, lung cancer phenotype or something like that. You know, it's more likely that Winnie's just the edge of a tail which random processes must generate. Maybe when she was 62, the postman knocked on the door at 11 a.m. She opened the door, gust of wind, she coughs, <coughs> coughs up something. Metaplastic. If the postman had come up one minute past 11 or, or 10.59, wouldn't have happened. You know, just some of these, these events, which it's impossible, even if you're following people around, even with these new wonderful sensors that I'm sure you think is gonna, are going to save, uh, save, save the world, you wouldn't be able to pick up those, those um, sorts of exposures. Or who's, here's Johannes Heaster. The reason I like Johannes Heaster better than Winnie is that you've got photos. He's a film actor. You've got photos of him smoking uh, uh, right the way through his, uh, his long life. He got 106. He gave up smoking. I did it for love for my wonderful wife. She should have me for as long as possible. You might get the sense that his wife might be a bit younger than him. <laughs> Although she does appear to have had some work, I would say. But uh, uh, Anyway, poor Johannes. He only lasted two years once he'd actually given up uh, smoking. So, you know, so Winnie's probably the, you know, the tale of a distribution. Studying Winnie's or, or people who live to 100 with smoke, it's probably useless because what you're basically what you're studying are a, a particular pattern of stochastic events which are unique, will only ever happen once, and you learn absolutely nothing. But the great thing about this, and the, you know, the great thing about uh, genetics is that they can teach you about things which influence the whole population. The wonder of the introduction of genetics is not Collins's 
fantasy of personalized or precision, or precision medicine. It is that they, they can give us really firm evidence on things like whether HDL cholesterol protect, protects against coronary heart disease. You know, so lung cancer in cohort studies, the pseudovariance explained by smoking is 5%, 10%, because most people don't die of lung cancer. So you do you calculate the pseudovariance. But you know, the geographical differences in the US are what explains virtually all of the variance between countries. Ditto, et cetera. So sm you know, smoking at a group level uh, is contributing to a, a very, very, very large percent of the cases of lung cancer. So it's 26% heritable. Now, the top uh, variant in the three GWASs published simultaneously of lung cancer was in a, that was found was a nicotine receptor, which related to how heavily you smoked. So that's fantastic. At the cost of $10 million, Mendelian randomization shows that smoking does indeed cause lung cancer, but if we hadn't known it, it would have been really, really informative. The shared environment, 12% will not be the, there is a shared environmental contribution to smoking, um, uh, which lasts, which is lasting, it's one of the traits which has a lasting shared environmental, and the, you know, the non-shared environment is 62%, which is simply unmeasured, un undealable with, or and largely undealable with. So for much percentages where you take some numbers that are up to 100, I just don't see what they mean. No. They don't have up to 100. For example, I mean, on smoking, there is a genetic variant which actually makes smokers less likely to get lung cancer. It's rare, but it knocks about you know, four fifths off their risk of lung cancer. So 80% of the lung cancer risk in smokers is caused by you know having a normal version of check two. It's genetic. I mean, yeah, yeah, but, yeah but, no, but, but this, this is just, so these statistics are just a population statistic saying that at any one cross-sectional time, they say nothing about, you know, changes over time, they say nothing about a different population. They just say that in that, uh, in that, in that population, the, your, your, uh, this is twin studies, so you're, talking, you're saying your total uh, genetic makeup, be it whether some variants increase risk or decrease risk or whatever, or interact with smoking, uh, you're saying that uh, that, that, that you know, adds, up, adds up to 26%, and in, in that population, it's a, it's a population, uh, it's a population-specific statistic. Measurement error goes into. Okay. 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 <laughs> so, uh, so is that you know? Anyone, so Peter Donnelly certainly sees me getting beaten up by Richard. Please come and <laughs> come and defend me. <laughs> uh, so most traits have a non-trivial heritable component. The good news is that the really good news is those genetic variants can tell us about modifiable causes of disease, and increasingly uh, are doing so. Exposures with apparently small contributions in terms of variants explained can account for most of the causes of disease in a population. This is Jeffrey Rose's you know, whole point about if everyone smoked 120 cigarettes a day, smoking could not relate to lung cancer in your population. So it explains 0% of the variants, but it's... Uh, uh, accounts for nearly all of the cases. Unstable aspects of non-shared environment may account for high proportions of the variants, but are intractable. But luckily, they won't often be confounded, uh, but in, in some circumstances. And modifiable exposures that the genetic and shared environmental components are, infor are informative about are likely to be the appropriate group-level public health targets, so like smoking, like LDL cholesterol, etc. That's the first thing. The, the others are be a lot shorter, you'll be pleased to know. The second level thing is that you can look at variance in response to uh, treatments. And you can, but you can, look in, you can either look in variance in, you know, this is a standard way of doing it, and Colin Bajant was very, very kindly uh, sent me these slides. These are in the uh, CTT, the statins uh, collaboration, and this is looking at the reduction in relative risk reduction uh, in, in uh, statin uh, in, in the trials, and you see for the, for the same treatment effect whether you, whatever your age, either gender, uh, you show pretty much the same relative effect. Of course, in, uh, you show very different absolute effects. The higher risk you are, the greater the absolute difference. Whatever your LDL cholesterol, that's very extremely interesting. It doesn't matter what your LDL cholesterol is. You just lower it. Uh, history of vascular disease or not. Of course, you have a much higher absolute risk reduction if, uh, if, you, have a, if you have a history of disease, uh, but not relative reduction, et cetera, diabetes, cheat hypertension. But, of course, you know, the whole notion of uh, precision medicine is on the basis of this is no good for precise medicine. You just, you know, put statins in the water. 
uh, which would probably be a good thing. Uh, precision medicine has this idea that it's heterogeneity. And of course, if you just show data from trial after trial after trial, showing there's no, there's no, they say, well, the next drug or the other drugs, drugs that haven't been looked at, they've got, they've got really obvious subgroup, uh, subgroup effects. Now, uh, R.A. Fisher, in a letter to uh, Daniels in uh, 1938, Daniels wrote to him about this uh, sort of problem of uh, heterogeneity of, uh, of response in uh, these agricultural studies that, of course, they were doing. And uh, Fisher wrote back, so in a, just in a few lines, he said, well, you can look at the variance in the outcome, and if there, if, if there are any interactions, to use today's terminology, if, 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 the, 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 if the treatment in your agricultural study is having an effect on one group that's beneficial and detrimental to the other group, the variance must increase. So just so, so, so analyze the variance. But uh, and Fisher, as you know, he was rather against uh, any comple you know, complexities in analysis. He, he said, you know, the point about, about the being heterogeneous response has, I think, received the rather large amount of theoretical attention that it has, chief it has chiefly through lack of contact with the practical experimental situation. I, the people who blabbered on about it were not people who'd ever done any of these studies, looked at any real data, et cetera. And I think this is uh, true. But the variance idea has not really been taken forward. There's uh, three studies. There's now, it's one of those things that's now hit. Um, people realize this is a way to go, and there's lots of papers going to come out. There's a nice, this paper uh, is the first uh, one that was published. Uh, and now, of course, the, you can come up with, like, with any data, you can come up with convoluted reasons why variance won't increase even when there's interactions. But you, you just consider the likelihood of the different situations. So there's no treatment effect. Uh, you would imagine, and uh, 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 the, no, equal no treatment effect, you'd add, the variance wouldn't change. There's absolutely, if there's a constant effect, like it looks at the group level there is with statins, then again, the variance uh, would not change. If there were these subpopulations, and this is what, you know, this is what the, uh, you know, the, you know, the stratified medicine has the idea that these subpopulations, reliably identifiable subpopulations, not these subpopulations based on after the fact, uh, data, uh, then you'd obviously you'd get bimodal distribution. You'd get obviously the variance would increase. Similarly, there's individual variability uh, in uh, in response. Um, now, I mean, you have rather less plausible situations. You could have, you know, treatment is stabilizing. It draws the people with low levels up and high levels down. It might not be the sort of uh, treatment uh, you'd want to, you'd want to go. Uh, oh no, that's, 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 that's yeah, subgroup differences with, de uh, with decreased variability. Yeah, so you could get decreased variability, you, I mean, and, and you know, with decreasing plausibility, you could have individual patient variability, which also is stabilizing. Or you could have this is the you know you could have these perfect crossovers. But these are in terms of plausibility, these are rather low in terms of plausibility, and it's also be extraordinary if, if, if one of these rather implausible things happened with all the treatments, just magically leaving sort of variants uh, the same. So there's been t uh, three systematic, uh, so the, the Cortez did a systematic review of about 120 studies, showed certainly no, uh, there was no general tendency for the variants to increase in the treated, in the treated group. This is a recent lovely paper uh, in JAMA Psychiatry, which, looked, which went back 50 years to every, uh, uh, every trial in schizophrenia, which had a continuous outcome measure. Uh, if anything, the variance was slightly lower in the treated group. And this is in, uh, depre in uh, depression trials. Uh, summary was there's, uh, when you go across all, tri all trials, no, 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 there's not, central estimate is there's no change in variance. So, I mean, the, the world could be organized in this extraordinarily confusing way where God has arranged that, you know, that everything has perfect crossovers or stabilizing. It's rather unlikely. The more likely thing is that there's not quite as much uh, uh, variability in response that we think. And this variance approach is rather lovely because you can apply it to all sorts of data. If you're looking at genetic data, uh, as uh, Peter Vischer's group have done and uh, Peter's uh, group have done and others have done, you can use the variance changes uh, to infer whether there are uh, epistatic or gene environment interactions or other uh, uh, unstabilizing uh, influences. But, but, but if you get a sort of, if you get some things which look rather null, that argues against those being that important, especially when you have, you need obviously large, very large sample sizes for testing variance differences. And this is uh, uh, 
Uh, Wang et al., you know, they looked at height where there's 1,063 QTLs for height and zero variance QTLs. And if you go through, and uh, those of you who have looked at interactions in, uh, in the post-genome wide association study age will know that, you know, uh, in, uh, body mass index and other indicators of adiposity have been the phenotypes that have been focused on. And, and indeed, here again, when they go through, that, that's the one. But there's still, it's a rather small number, uh, a rather small percentage of the genetic variants show uh, evidence of, uh, of, of variance difference. So this, is, this is fantastic for Mendelian randomization because you can use this for the, 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 if they show variance difference, then they're invalid instruments, so you could remove them from, from uh, analyses, which is what we're implementing. Anyway, so the, so the bottom line is there's not a huge number, there's rather few, uh, and uh, when you actually look at them, when you actually go onto the supplementary material and look at them, there's only one of all, of the, of all the, of the ones they showed which shows a substantially larger uh, or more robust effect for the VQTL and the QTL. <laughs> and it is the FEV to FVC ratio, and it is the genetic variant related to lung cancer, which relates to more heavy smoking. And sure enough, you've got some smokers and some non-smokers in the population. You show, uh, you show uh, you know, uh, strong statistical evidence of, variance, of, of the variance inflation, uh, which is actually stronger than the overall QTL effect, as you'd imagine, because you've just got an effect in one group, not the other. But you're combining them, and you show great, you know, you show by allele variants, and it goes down. down. Uh, um, the mean goes down because the smoke, the, the, this is the variant with a, where they've got two copies of the variant that leads to heavier smoking amongst the smokers, and you get an overall decreased effect because I bring you new, new news. Smoking is bad for your lung function. That's, uh, that was, which, that was, which is actually what that shows, but that's the only example that comes out. And in terms of looking for things which uh, uh, interact with statins, you know, <laughs> remember our friend uh, Francis Collins was looking at CTP, was interacting uh, with, uh, you know, with, with uh, statin use. You, you use a genetic instrument for, the st for statins, which is constructed of variants across the HMG coreductase gene, which mimics the effects, and you just replicate the effects from the randomized trials, of course, with less effect on coronary heart disease because it's only lowering your uh, cholesterol for five or six years as opposed to in trials as opposed to lifetime. And this is the, <laughs> this is the QQ plot for the evidence of there being uh, any uh, interaction. <laughs> Uh, uh, with the HMG co-reductase score. So, so these, me these methods allow you to get some, at least put some boundaries on what uh, is possible. And this is just, I love this, this is, <laughs> this is the, these, these, are the, these are the BMI interactions. So as we said, BMI does, is, is, the, is the phenotype which, uh, which has been the pinup for interactions. And a very large number have been published uh, uh, of these interactions, for example, if you, if you drink sugar-sweetened beverages, your genetic risk uh, for, uh, for the, with the obesity uh, polygenic score is greater. Similarly, if you eat fried food, it's great. And so they use that to say, don't drink sugar. This tells us not to drink sugar-sweetened beverages. Fried food, it's greater as well. That's interesting. It seems these biological methods, mechanisms through which sugar and then also fried food, it has some, has some effect. Oh, I'm watching the telly. <laughs> that has an effect as well. And oh yeah, come on, let's 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 use observational data to see whether this, you know, whether uh, uh, there's interaction with adhering to our dietary interventions that we want to do. And sure enough, you find those. Uh, but as we know from these trials, I've been feeling about the data; it doesn't really seem to have any effect. So uh, so we were uh, analysing these data, and we thought. This, you know, the things that are rather similar here, it's rather things that, you know, poor people. So we looked at the Townsend Index, and of course that predicts. And then we thought, of, let's look at other behaviours rather than not watching telly, not eating fried food, and not drinking uh, sugared beverages that they're better off doing. Buy a bank, and what they do is, because it's expensive, they use sun cream. And sure enough, you get a mass, big interaction with sun cream use. If you, if you use sun cream, your genetic risk score predicts a smaller increase in BMI. So just slap on the sun cream, and, uh, and, your, and, your, and your BMI is going to go down. There you go. So uh, twins. So of course, the other natural, another natural experiment. I've only got two more to go, and they get shorter and shorter. John's looking as though he's going to fall asleep. But uh, uh, um, so, I'm going to, so twins. So in terms of prediction, obviously from genetics, your twin, uh, what your revealed phenotype in your twin. Uh, would be, should be a useful predictor. Because remember, that picks up the entire genome. 
that will pick up all the, all the uh, rare variants that, that you're not imputing with your genome-wide association data. It will pick up all the epistatic effects to the extent there are any, because it, because, uh, but which you won't get just with your additive genetics. So you get the, you get the total genetic effect. And although I, uh, the methods one can uh, discuss, you know, Roberts and Co. used uh, the then available uh, twin data to look at the, the best sort of fit they could use with whether one twin gets a disease as a predictor of whether the other uh, twin will, where you can actually sort of set, uh, you know, set the sensitivity and specificity or, or the predictive uh, effects can be, uh, can be best. And, uh, and they found you know, these sort of percentages of people who uh, using that best uh, predictor uh, you would get. And what you find is that you know, a fraction of cases who would test positive uh, by, by the percentage of cases, the people actually then get the disease. So it's only about 10% who, you, who you're sort of picking up. Uh, and of the cases, for some conditions, you know, like uh, thyroid autoimmunity, your twin effect is, uh, is a reasonable predictor. For most of them, while this is predictive, and this is not something you can ever, you, I mean, you can't uh, get this with whole genome sequencing because you don't get the epistasis with whole genomes. Uh, no, you, sorry, you, you can with whole genome sequencing if you've got the whole, the whole genome. You can only get this with whole genome sequencing. Sorry, you can't get it with uh, GWAS, uh, um, et cetera. So, uh, so, that, so, so that, gives, that gives you a sort of limit uh, of what you can get. And this is the relative risk of disease in individuals testing negative. So, you know, you show 20% sort of reductions. Again, type 1 diabetes, as John would imagine, you do uh, better, and your trial's going to make that come down. That's going to, because once you intervene, then you know, at high risk, you're going to hit zero. So, uh, so it, these things obviously can get better with treatments, et cetera. If, 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 the, if the genotype is actionable, they can get better. But uh, for many of the conditions, the whole uh, genome data, uh, complete with uh, epistasis uh, and uh, rare variants and everything, uh, uh, is not that uh, wonderful. So that's, that's, that's the limit of your genetic prediction. People who test positive or relative to the whole population. Sorry? Are the relative risk relative to the whole population or relative to people who test positive? It's, it's relative to the whole population. I think I'll have to go back and look. I'll look. I, I'll, uh, yeah, I, I, I can't remember. I, I think it's the whole population. I think it's the whole population. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to. I'll have to. I'd have to go back and look. So the final thing, and I'll be even quicker on this one, uh, is uh, bilateral cancers. So. So twins is you've got your, ident your genetically identical twin, what, whether they develop a disease. So that's a pretty, you'd think that, that's a predictor which will pick up quite a lot of things. But even better than that is imagine that you're a twin split, you know, one side of you is the twin of the other side. Now the difference there is not only if you've got all the genetic, all the, uh, the germline genotype, you'll have a whole stack of the somatic mutations will be the same in, uh, uh, on both sides, not all of them, but uh, uh, you know, a stack of them, for, depending how early uh, they are. Uh, and every single exposure you can imagine, you're, you're matched on. So consider your two kidneys. You know, we look at risk factors. You've got the, the germline G DNA is the same. Whether you eat the uh, fruits and veg are the same. Whether you smoke, it's going to have the same effect on your left kidney and your right kidney. Whether you drink, whether you uh, exercise or not. So then what happens, so when you've got these perfect, you know, the perfect match, uh, if you develop uh, cancer of the parenchyme, this is parenchymal cancer of the kidney, uh, what's the risk for the other kidney? Now, uh, as uh, Richard Pito pointed out many years ago with respect to breast cancer, of course, you've got to think that there's only one kidney at risk, so you've got to sort of double the, uh, uh, you've only got one at risk, so you've got to double uh, that risk. So with uh, the bet for the, the largest study of uh, renal cancer suggests it's about two. So that's matched on everything. So how are you going to let's think? How are you going to predict better than having than the other side of the body? How, I mean, what are you going to do biopsies and, and you know do sequencing every year? Maybe, but uh, you're going to do you know, uh, but, but tumor DNA? Yeah, maybe. So you can once the thing's developed, you can get. But if you're looking at prediction for uh, prevention, you know how are you going to do it? And uh, as uh, Julian's here. Uh, I'd already put this slide in. I obviously would have taken it out if I'd known you was going in. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't. Uh, I mean, I think one of the great... I'm putting this up because I, I, I think everyone should read it because it is one of the great, it is one of the great 
uh, mysteries. He's thinking of an, uh, another bilateral cancer. If you, th if you think of uh, breast cancer, then the earlier, this is for the, in twins, monozygotic, dizygotic, the earlier that the, uh, your, uh, your twin uh, develops uh, breast cancer, the greater your risk is, which is in some ways what you'd expect, you know, <coughs> when people with BRCA1-2 mutations on, develop breast cancer earlier, uh, tend to develop breast cancers earlier as a group than those um, uh, without. Uh, but, then you, but then you get uh, the incidence in the, in the MZ twin is actually higher than the patient's of the breast, which is remarkable. Now, of course, the MZ twin has got two breasts, so you'd imagine it to be, has, uh, uh, to be double, but that is sort of matching on all the exposure. Now, there's been there's quite a small amount of data here. Julian was involved in a study from Scandinavia where this came down a, a bit, and there's been a very re a recent uh, Nordic uh, collaboration, but which, but, but which uh, still uh, shows this uh, somewhat uh, remarkable uh, situation. Now, if, you, if you've got BRCA, you know, BRCA1, BRCA2, say, the, um, as um, you get uh, uh, um, uh, reasonable uh, ascertainment in, in, in populations, when you're sequencing populations, so you don't sequence according to family membership, the risks are going down for BRCA, BRCA1 and 2, as they are for um, many other sort of monogenic conditions. But, you know, say in the, from the Went from the older studies, say the risk is about five times, then your risk of getting bilateral cancer is a bit over five times the general population too, but a second cancer. But so it's the same, so the level is sort of set by that genetic risk, but all that matching on all the exposures is doing rather is doing rather little. But I mean that of course that doesn't mean that these things are at all uh, unalterable. I mean this is presumably when this is the uh, uh, rates for contra contralateral breast cancer over time when treatments came in, treatments which um, might also, like tamoxifen, reduce the risk uh, of developing a second primary uh, in, the other, in the other breast. So those are four sets of data which I think you know, given, uh, give some constraints on what predict the predictive aspect of uh, precision medicine. And one's got to remember that there's lots of effective Medicine. I mean, this is the data that came out uh, a week ago. You know, on the prevalent on, on uh, HPV vaccination, started it started in eight, uh, eighteen year olds, and you see this beautiful lag. It only starts going down for the group who are young enough to, to get uh, vaccination. So you know, there are there are ways of dealing with diseases in populations which will have uh, you know uh, which have very large effects. So the very bad you know the bad news is that the best prediction. Is existing disease. So if you actually get, you know, if you, the, the best way to predict someone's got a disease is actually just have some measure, which is essentially a measure of the disease. But that really misses the point of a lot of these aspects of uh, uh, of precision medicine, the predictive, which is the front of uh, Hood's, um, uh, you know, Hood's uh, statements. And you know, here you have the, you know, obviously they are, you know, situations where treatments, are, uh, where treatments. Uh, which are, will relate to the specific mutations are being given in, uh, in cancers. This is a review from, the, um, from JAMA Oncology on one of the rounds of reports for NCI Match. I don't know if people know about NCI Match. It's a trial that's very well worth following up, which is, is mutation-specific treatment, even, even when, if it's the same mutation in different cancers, they're, they're including those in the groups. And as it points out, it's extremely the first rounds of data that have come out of NCI Match uh, are not... Uh, Massively encouraging. I mean, this, in some situations, some treatments they are for some mutations, they're showing some uh, benefits. But it's not quite this vision that uh, Collins uh, promised, really, is it? I think, I think, I think for the, for, the, the, for this has been the pinup uh, of the of this precision medicine. Uh, it's as I say, it's not quite what we've been sold. So we go back to P4 medicine and Hood's latest paper. And the P4 acronym stands for a new concept and practice of medicine. Predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. Unlike the new integrative movements which seek to extend or complement traditional medicine, to embrace omics, P4 medicine places healthcare on a new fundament, a new academic discipline in its own right, systems biology. Now, I'm not very clever, so I looked up fundament. <laughs> and... I, 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 I probably would have gone for number two 
as the uh, definition that I presume they were, uh, they were uh, aiming at. And, and why does any of this you know, matter outside of the fact that you've got jobs in the precision medicine unit? So I think some of it matters about when the, we have this ideology of prediction. And the whole thing, from, because it was based on genomic medicine, gives us this idea that this, you know, genetics has this particular uh, ontological status. And here's um, uh, William Moore, who is a PhD student, I think, still in Oxford, I'm not sure, but he's, uh, one, of the, he's uh, one of Boris Johnson's uh, health advisors saying, no, the only way to prevent is to predict. And DNA is the best predictor around. This is the person advising uh, Boris Johnson. He thinks that, you know, the germline DNA is the best predictor around. A genetic test costing 20 quid and identify individuals fortify, I mean, of every major chronic disease. I mean, fuck's sake. This is, and this is going to spend limited resources on this. So, fundament might be the right word. And then yesterday, or the day before yesterday, Charles Murray, the author of The Bell Jar, just comes up with the same sort of dialogue. Discourse, sorry. You know, he's now saying polygenic scores are revolutionary because they're causal in one, only one direction. So, he's sort of got Mendelian randomization, but he's got it wrong. Uh, they don't drop because tests make you nervous or rise because you grow up rich. They're impervious to racism and other forms of prejudice. Socioeconomic and cultural environments can play an important role in how those bits of DNA are expressed, but they don't change the codes themselves. Uh, that means polygenic scores will offer social scientists something they've never had before, a secure place to stand in assessing what is innate and what is added by the environment. And you can imagine what Murray is going to say, uh, what the uh, implications of those are. His new book was out uh, two days ago. So, that, so, so the, the, the sort of discourse, which, which, uh, which you know, might for many reasons might want to sort of, might want to give privilege uh, this predictor of a power which does not exist of DNA, I think is potentially uh, damaging, potentially socially damaging. And I actually think what may, you know, one of the important things out, rather than have a, a center for precision medicine, you should, you know, you should have a, a, a center for explaining the role of luck and chance <laughs> in people's lives, because that's massively more important. I mean, every form of data tells you that the chance events, luck, is the most important. And I think we can go to a social thinker uh, who I have somewhat more respect for than, uh, than uh, Charles Murray on that, because uh, you know, what's pointed out is that uh, with, you know, with Murray's ideology and with what War is saying about the DNA being predictor, people who do well, you know, people who work, do well, they say that's because, uh, it, you know, that's innate, that's because they're great people, they're really smart, they've got, you know, they've got high, you know, their, their genetics and mean they're really intelligent and they've got where they are because they deserve it. And, there, and uh, therefore, you know, the notion of helping the undeserving uh, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't come about. So we go back to think of uh, Rawls, you know, John Rawls, who had this notion about, you know, about we should decide about us, the society we want if we think we're in a situation where we don't know what our position in that society is going to be. Now, more so than people think, you know, everyone here is privileged, but more so than people think, even if you've got a really high polygenic score for education and you're wealthy, Things can go wrong, you know, things go wrong in people's lives, you know, including disease and including, you know, the kids not doing quite as well as one hoped uh, or, uh, or, you know, or worse. So, but, so this discourse which tells us that everything's predictable and, that, and everything is worthy and won by uh, what you have uh, takes you away from this notion that you actually want to, you actually, your ideal, in, in the, behind the veil of ignorance, you'd actually want to have a society which has safety nets, which uh, saves people. And people should actually, you know, realise that, if you do well, it's because you're lucky uh, rather than uh, your DNA. And this uh, discourse of explanation, I think, uh, can be damaging. And like most things which are sensible, uh, they're said in uh, great novels. And in the two, the two greatest novels, in my view, from the US of the 20th century, Thomas Pynchon's wonderful V, he says, the process of learning life's single lesson, that there's more accident in it than a man can ever admit to in a lifetime and stay sane or James Salter's beautiful light years, where he's talking about uh, cancer. He actually says, we cannot imagine these diseases. They're called idiopathic, spontaneous in origin. But we know instinctively there must be something more, some invisible weakness they're exploiting. It's impossible to think they fall at random. It's not unbearable to think it. But I actually think going around, so change your name, you know, the, the center for, for, for <laughs> non-shared environment studies or something. <laughs> center for chance, thanks very much.
10 minutes time for some questions. I'll let George pick them out of the audience so you can uh, exert your bias. On who it's got to be a not a pito, because I've had two pitos so far. <laughs> <laughs> Shared environment. Yeah? So, um, in your little example of uh, these very old people who have smoked for a long time, you seem to suggest that it's not worth studying extreme cohorts of individuals because the non shared environment is by far the biggest source of variation. But it would seem to me that those individuals are actually at the extremes of two distributions. They're the extremes of the genetic distribution and the non-shared environment distribution, and actually also the, the shared environment distribution as well. So if you go extreme enough, they'll actually be extreme for all of those factors, and then perhaps therefore worth studying. Yeah, and that's an, that's an interesting point, and something that, uh, you know, when you've got you know, as you get bigger and bigger studies, bigger and bigger family studies in particular, there's about uh, 450,000 GWAS SIB pairs we have now in a <laughs> consortium, uh, family-based MR consortium. You could start, you could uh, look at that. I think it's an em empirical question to the, to the extent that uh, what you'd see. And, I mean, you could, you could model it. Uh, I mean, you can model it assuming these things are orthogonal. And now they're sort you know, the estimation strategies, and I'll talk to Richard about those later after drink. Uh, the estimation strategies uh, sort of force them you know, to be uh, orthogonal, and the non-shared environment is certainly orthogonal. So you could actually, you know, simulate from that to see what you'd expect, but that, and then, uh, and then um, you know, try and actually get some data to look at that. I mean, as you, I'm sure... You know, no, the uh, um, those are sort of extreme uh, phenotype uh, GWAS approaches uh, were not ones which uh, uh, delivered uh, very much. And I say this as someone who the Wellcome Trust gave several several million quid to to do a very extreme BMI study. And I hadn't really worked all this out, but and, uh, and we took you know the extremes of BMI. Danny, um, th there seems to be more great tendency to try to say you can fix. The, the thing that's been bugging me recently is uh, before the general election, quite a lot of silence. Uh, we then get a result which is at the extremes of the new Gov 100,000 poll. And now I have to read endless authoritative commentaries about exactly why December the 12th happened. Isn't there something just innate in human beings? We just can't stop ourselves making these claims. <coughs> Because just saying, oh, yeah. chances must be important. But where do you go after saying chances must be important? No, no, I, no. I, I absolutely agree with that. And uh, there's, you know, there's been a lot of sort of evolutionary uh, writing uh, on why, uh, you know, hum it, why it's, it's ev has an evolutionary advantage to overestimate what is cause. You know, if you're if you're a, if you're a sort of um, you know if you're an antelope somewhere, and you hear something scream then it's the best thing to do is think there's a tiger and run. You know, if you, uh, if you, if you don't sort of respond believing in these things be, having a sort of cause, then you history. And so, so there's been quite a lot of writing about the uh, evolution of gullibility uh, or, the, you know, or the belief in, 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 things, in things being causal and, and understandable. And I think that's, you know, Salter's... That's what you know, Salter's and Pynchon's point is that it's just... It's, you know, it's difficult to live with. Uh, thinking that at, uh, everything is chance, unless you're Charles Bukowski. You don't write as well as Pynchon and uh, Salter, but you probably have a more enjoyable, I don't know, anyway. But one political point, I mean, in relation to social class and achievement, I mean, you know, I mean, studies where, where you, you measure compare with social class and IQ, IQ is an incredibly strong predictor of, of, of upward social ability. Mm. So, I mean, I think, I, I think that I mean, IQ is actually I mean, a surprisingly good measure for its whole. So, yeah, so, so one of the really interesting things is, we, as I say, we've got these SIB pairs, we're looking at uh, uh, between SIB pairs when they share the same parents, and it's the, it's the traits which show that there is what's called a dynastic effect, i.e. the effect is not through your genotype. The effect is that your genotype comes correlated with what the parents provide because of their genotype. So these dynastic effects, Lush discussed, discussed them in, dam, you know, in terms of in, uh, animal breeding in 1943, but were sort of largely forgotten about in, uh, in, in, in human genetics. But if, so if you look at sort of traits, uh, you know, biomarker traits like C-reactive protein, you know, you, you, your GWAS between siblings shows the same as your GWAS in the overall population. 
But if you look at things like education, of course, then, then, if, then people who have a higher education score, their parents have a higher education score, and because of assortative mating, what, uh, um, uh, the, the whole genome, not just the ones you get, uh, uh, so the non-transmitted alleles, so you can look at the, the alleles from your parents that you don't get, the individual doesn't get, which, so, so th those, those alleles cannot be having an effect because of your genome. They explain the estimates are around a half of 40%, uh, 50% of the effect of the, of, of, the, of the genotype on education and intelligence uh, shows similar attenuation. So it's, the, it's, the, it's this multiplicative uh, process that the, the environment is having an effect, but, but the parental genotype influences the environment uh, they give. It's really dramatic. It's a, 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 a dramatic effect. So that's, that's it's going to be a really interesting uh, area to investigate because in the, you know, the notion should be that if you could, reconstru if you could construct that environment for all, it would, you know, you know, it, it would have effects, but how you do that uh, without, you know, how, how that's done in terms of, you know, social policy, uh, is it very, it's very difficult to know. But absolutely, I mean, educational attainment is heritable, really quite highly, is, 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 uh, is highly heritable. And whatever uh, scoring highly on intelligence strongly, tests means is heritable. It's strongly predictor of social mobility. And, and, predict, yeah. and predict social mobility, yeah. yeah. And therefore, within a, 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 a few generations, you predict a very large separation of average so, between social classes. So, so I think uh, I, I think social the way social arrangements have changed are going to lead to uh, uh, increasing uh, polarization um, through through uh, uh, particularly through assortative mating. So I think assortative mating uh, will get stronger, and that things like internet uh, finding your partners on the internet means you have bigger choice. And, uh, uh, and there's evidence that uh, you know, assortative mating has been getting stronger in the U.S. for really a long time, but then you know, having a much wider choice. I mean, you know, it used to be that people's grandparents were all born within five miles of each other. You know, geography used to be the thing which, which drove that. So, so there are definitely processes which are things which I think uh, one needs, uh, that need to be uh, thought about because it's not as though you can uh, enact sort of random, uh, you know, random mating. Um, uh, and, yeah, and absolutely is, um, is, a, is, a, is a, a trend. Which, which will happen socially, which we, we should actually face, yeah. A bit after 5 o'clock, one last question, or? Uh, you have some sympathy for the fact that there's no really good predictor, but DNA is the best of them, possibly, even if it's not really predicting that much? No, but it's not the best. It's, uh, well, yeah. it, it's not the best. I mean, if you want to predict smoking, yep. you take DNA methylation. It's a really, really good predictor. In fact, I mean, I mean, extraordinarily, if you've got a, sort of a, a DNA methylation, you're looking at prediction of lung cancer, reported smoking can drop out of your model because the DNA marker is better than uh, you know, people saying that they, uh, say they smoke. Uh, so, um, you know, because it's a long-term, it's a ramp sum measure, it's, based, it's stable. I mean, you can tell. So I will, I, I will have MCOG1 uh, methylation difference. My mum smoked two couple of packs a day pregnant with me, and we showed in 60 year olds you can see a meth uh, a, a almost you know, a, a methylation signature of maternal smoking in utero, which is what you'd expect because some of these methylation sites are completely, repro are completely reproducible across, just reproduce themselves across cell division, across life. So, um, so there's much better predictors. And uh, I'm, I'm, you know, one of the exciting things is you can build, uh, and the great thing is if you've got the DNA, you can do the methylation, uh, and you can build models based on things that you know predict that will do better than measuring the things themselves. So if you, CRP is a reasonable predictor of a lot of, of, a lot of dying from a lot of things. Uh, but if you get a methylation indicator of that, it will be, it will, that will tell you the long term, which will be much better than a, a single measure or two measures or whatever. So, uh, so there, are, there are definitely better, better predictors. But I mean, you'd use them all. And I mean, the thing I think about, if I was going to say about you know, personalized medicine, about you know, general practice, et cetera, you know, I think, and, and you're using the Q-risk score or whatever, if you've got the GWAS data, and it's not a question of whether, it's not, I don't think it's a question of whether, I think it's a question of it'll, when, and it'll probably be 10 years or whatever, uh, you would include it. You know, if you're going to predict who, when, who should start statins if you don't think we should actually put it in the water. Uh, if you've got, the, if you've got the, the cardiogram score, you'd use it to, uh, to, predict, to, add, to add to your predictive equation. I mean, the sad thing is with many of these, with, with, is, that, is that because people have focused on causes, they've not included 
uh, or only, only recently included social measures, for example, which predict higher risk, which should, should actually predict getting better treatment, as Julian uh, Tudor Hart said uh, in 1971. Fantastic. Given the time, we'll have to uh, draw it to a close there. So thanks so much for a fantastic talk.